every beat is calling out your name.
Well, hello, my name is Doug, and I'm one of the pastors at Next Level Church, and we are so glad that you're here today. Uh, we know that, that we have folks from, from Wisconsin and Idaho, uh, but you know, we also have folks from around the world, like Spain and Singapore, uh, and even Australia. And so we are so glad uh, that you're here. And here's the deal, we would love to connect with you. Why? Because we're all on a journey. We believe that, and we believe that you're on a journey with Jesus. And we want to connect with you. And the only way we can do that is for you to reach out to us and connect with us. So here on the screen, you can take a look. You can either scan the QR code or you can text the word online to the number on the screen. And here's what's going to happen. You're going to receive a text and then you're going to reply to that. And you're going to fill that form out. And once you fill that form out, over a, a week or so, we're going to send you a few texts that, that are going to, we're going to ask you a few questions and we're going to get your response back because why most importantly we want to pray for you and so just if you'll do that that'll be awesome and we'll we'll be able to connect with you so again we're glad you're here we hope that today more than anything else that you experience jesus let me pray for us real quick lord jesus thank you so much that we can worship you in the name of jesus amen Well, good morning, friends. My name is Krista McLean, and I am the student and family ministries pastor here at Next Level Church, and we are in week four of our series on miracles. My husband and I were married in October of 2000, and in June of 2001, we received a late night phone call that his brother, his middle brother, had been involved in a baseball-related accident. Um, Michael was an amazing baseball player at just the age of 16. He had already been scouted by several college teams and he was looking at a definite college career, if not beyond. The night that he was injured, he um, was playing in an American Legion baseball tournament and he was going after a fly ball. Another teammate was also going after the ball and Michael dove for the ball and at the last minute, his teammate saw him out of the corner of his eye and went to jump to try to avoid colliding with him. The teammate's knee caught Michael in the back of the head and it cracked his skull from the base of one ear to the base of the other. Those who were at the field that night uh, said that you could hear the crack in the stands and Michael was knocked out cold immediately. Upon impact, Michael suffered a traumatic brain injury and a stroke on his right side. And as we arrived at the hospital that night, we were told that his chances of survival were low, and it was a wait-and-see situation. So many people were praying for him. He really needed a miracle, and we were praying for one. In the weeks after the accident, we began to see exactly how many miracles God had put into place that night. It had been VBS week at my in-law's church, and they never missed VBS. They were always serving. But my father-in-law had felt an overwhelming need to be at the field that night. Um, he was former EMS, and everyone who was at the game that night said that he cleared about a six-foot fence and was the first one at Michael's side on the field when he went down. At VBS, there was another family friend who took the call about what had happened. He was able to inform a mother-in-law that there had been an accident and take her calmly to the hospital without ever actually alerting her to what she would find when she arrived. My husband surprisingly enough, did not argue when I insisted on driving the three hours to get there, and he slept the entire way. 
I had just finished my first year teaching, and I had not actually taken a summer job yet, so I was free to assist in taking care of Michael. I did night duty in ICU so that my in-laws could sleep at night. Um, my parents lived nearby, and they were actually away on a trip, so I was able to use their car, have free use of it when we were in town. And so many little details just happened to fall into place. Michael spent approximately three weeks in ICU before moving to a regular room and then on to inpatient rehab and then finally home with outpatient rehab. His recovery took well over a year, and people often referred to him as Miracle Mike. Some people would have called his situation absolutely impossible, and at times it felt that way. Michael's dreams of playing baseball were never actually realized, though he does enjoy a really good game of wiffle ball with the family when we get together. But today, Michael is a successful family therapist in a shared practice. Miracles tend to take place in impossible situations, situations where there is nothing that we can humanly do about the problem that we are facing. So I want to quickly look at a few passages that directly address the impossible. In Matthew 19.26, Jesus was speaking about when rich, man, rich men enter heaven. And Jesus said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. In Luke 1.27, where the angel who met with the young Virgin Mary pronounced that she would soon become pregnant and give birth to the Son of God, the angel said, for nothing will be impossible with God. In Mark 9, 23b, where Jesus was having a conversation with a distraught father who had come to him asking him to exorcise an evil demon from his possessed son, Jesus said to him, everything is possible for one who believes. Do you believe those statements? I mean, do you really believe them? Do you believe that what is impossible with man is possible with God? Let's ask it another way. Is there anything that is too hard for God? There's a kid's ministry leader who was quizzing her kids after a series of lessons on God's omnipotence. She asked, is there anything that God can't do? There was some silence. And finally, a little boy held up his hand. And the teacher, feeling just a little bit disappointed that the lesson's point had been missed, asked, well, what is it that God can't do? Well, the little boy replied, he just can't please everybody. In this message series called Miracles, we have discovered that faith gives us a new way to live. And we experience God by faith. Time and time again, God has proven to me that with him, nothing is impossible. There have been numerous times in my life that God has moved in impossible situations and no matter what you are facing in your life, nothing is impossible for God. Now, as human beings, we have some unique ways of expressing what it's like to face an impossible situation. We talk about things going from bad to worse, or jumping from the frying pan into the fire, or being between a rock and a hard place. And sometimes we say, cheer up, things could get worse. So we cheer up, and then things actually get worse. And the truth is, everyone faces impossible situations at some point in his or her life. And some of those situations we have absolutely no control over, like the breakup of a relationship, or a challenge that seems to have no solution, or the attempts to reach a rebellious child, or a financial setback that you had no way of foreseeing, <clears throat> a friend who stabs you in the back, the loss of a job, a sudden health crisis, watching your parents grow older, or experiencing the effect of aging yourself. Some of those situations we do have control over, like an unloving spirit, or jealousy, or pride, or lust, or passion, or harsh judgment of other people, or a complaining spirit, or feelings of irritability, or selfishness. Impossible situations, whether forced upon us or brought upon ourselves, we all face them. But God never intended for those situations to do us in. Over the last few weeks, we've seen Jesus calm a storm by merely speaking. We've watched him help a man who is blind from birth to see simply by using mud that he mixed with his own spit. We saw a woman who suffered from an illness of 12 years healed by merely touching the hem of his garment. Last week, we were in Mark 5, 21 through 20, 34. And by way of quick review, Joseph shared with you last week about a synagogue leader 
who came to see Jesus about help for his daughter. And Jesus followed him, and on the way, Jesus got interrupted by a woman who had an issue of blood that she had suffered with for 12 years. And she reaches out in faith, and she touches the robe of Jesus, believing in faith that if she could just touch his robe, she would be healed. And she is healed. And Jesus stops his journey to interact with her and restore her identity and her dignity. And after being briefly introduced to Jairus last week, we're going to return to Mark today to hear the rest of Jairus' story. So let's go to Mark 5, 21 through 24. It says, Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side, to the lake, where the large crowd gathered around him on the shore. And then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. And Jesus went with him, and all the people followed him, crowding around him. So a man breaks through the crowd, falls at Jesus' feet, and his name is Jairus. And he's identified as a synagogue official. And most synagogue officials were opposed to Jesus at that time, which makes it even more dramatic that he falls at the feet of Jesus. And this man's little girl is dying. And any father in the same situation would have done exactly what he did. And in the passage, Mark emphasizes that the crowd, they pressed around him. And Jesus and the father most likely have to slowly make their way through the crowd, which is just pushing all in on them. And I can tell you right now, I can barely tolerate a drive through lane when it's being run inefficiently. And in this situation, I would have been beside myself. It's not difficult for me to imagine the anguish of the Father at the pace that they must have been moving, especially when Jesus stopped to ask who touched him. Remember, this man's daughter is dying, and every second counts. Surely Jairus must have been growing restless as Jesus insisted on waiting for a response to his question, who touched my robe? And then the woman, she comes forward and she confesses, and what do you think was going through Jairus' mind? And heart as he heard her story. She'd been sick for 12 years. And his daughter was 12 years old. And now the woman was healed with just a touch. Surely that would have boosted his hopes. And now if Jesus would just hurry up and come on. Mark 5.35. While he was still speaking to her, his messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. And they told him, your daughter is dead There's no use in troubling the teacher now. I have a little problem with the messengers. I mean, I don't know who they were, but they seem a little insensitive to me. Maybe you kind of had to be there to know that they were really actually being kind and sensitive, but it doesn't really seem that way. I mean, couldn't they have waited until he got back to the house? Or couldn't they have at least taken him aside? And what about that there's no use in troubling the teacher? I mean, they could have been just a little bit more sensitive, in my opinion. And what about the father? It's got to be he's just experienced a parent's worst nightmare. And Jairus gets to hear this terrible news in the middle of a crowd that is excited. He gets to hear it just as he would have been filled with a whole lot of hope that everything would be okay. And then Jesus speaks. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. I like Jesus' response. He ignores the bad news bearers. He focuses on the grief-stricken father. Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Jairus hears exactly what he needs to restore just a little bit of hope. And you and I have probably said words just like this to people in our lives who have been discouraged or even anxious. We've said them in in attempts to encourage them. Don't worry. Everything's going to be okay. Have faith. It's going to be fine. We've said the words but we probably haven't actually believed them ourselves. But Jesus, no doubt, is trying to encourage the Father. But these are not mere hopeful words. His encouragement is also a command. He said similar words to his disciples after calming the storm in Mark 440. He said, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? I mean, this is not a Disney movie. Jesus is not telling the Father that if he believes and wishes really hard for what he wants and clicks his heels together three times, then his wish will come true. 
Jesus is telling the father, trust me to save your daughter. Believe in me. And honestly, I don't really know what the father is feeling in this moment. I don't know if he's regained his hope or if he's in a state of shock or just going along with whatever he is told. But he continues on with Jesus. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. And he went inside and asked, why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead. She's only asleep. And the crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave. And he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Clearly, Jesus is unbothered by the news that came from Jairus' house. And he takes charge, and Jesus stops the crowd from following him. He selects only three disciples to continue on with him, and he enters a house full of commotion, and he clears them out. And to his credit, Jairus is still following Jesus. By this point, he could have broken down and protested against Jesus doing anything, which would have been understandable and completely expected as a response from a grief-stricken parent. The people who had to deal, that Jesus had to deal with, were the mourners who were crying and wailing loudly. But he walked in, he treated them as people who were completely out of place, and he told them that the girl was just merely sleeping, even though he hadn't even yet seen her. And the mourners thought Jesus was absolutely crazy, and they treated him as such. So Jesus cleared them out. He took, again, complete control of the situation. And Jairus, the head of the house, seems to go along with whatever Jesus says and does. So Jesus takes the parents and the three disciples into the little girl's room. Holding her hand, he said to her, Telitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the little girl, who was 12 years old, immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened, and then he told them to give her something to eat. Can you imagine how those parents felt in that moment? Astonished, dumbfounded, startled, bewildered. I can imagine them laughing, crying, holding their daughter, hugging Jesus, overflowing with thankfulness, absolutely shaking with joy. They'd gone from experiencing their biggest nightmare to the most incredible of all their dreams coming true. Their daughter had come back to life. And I like the very last part of the passage that says, he told them to give her something to eat. It reminds us that this is a real story, not a Hallmark TV special that makes us feel good. As we think back through the story, I think we would all agree that Jairus has been faced with an extremely difficult situation, a downright impossible one. His little girl was dead. And as human beings, we need to understand that there's a box that we all live in. If you could just imagine the room that we're in right now, or maybe the room that you're in, being a box. And the walls represent what is possible for human beings to do. And within this box, it is impossible for someone who is dead to come to life again. So in order to prepare for our own miracles, we must accept that we serve a God that can do the impossible. And to do that, we have to do just a few things. The first thing that we must do is we must think outside the box. Just because it's not possible right now doesn't mean that it can't be. Impossible to us doesn't mean that it's impossible to God. When you think outside the box, you see the box of impossible, impossible become what is possible. God is as big as you believe that he is. The minute you don't believe that God can help you in any situation, that's when you put God in a box and put restrictions on him. Our God can do anything that we ask him to do if it's according to his will. We can't blame for God not helping us or our families with our problems if we don't believe that he's capable of helping us anyway. We are guilty of putting God's abilities in a box and believing that he can only do so much. But God doesn't belong in a box where we just take him out when it's convenient for us or when we're, we're in trouble. We need to learn to think outside the box because our God exists outside of the box. There's no box or walls that confine his actions or his power. And we need to learn to think outside the box as followers of Jesus. Secondly, we must be willing to reach outside the box. 
I think we need to hear the command of Jesus to reach outside the box by faith. You see, God knows what you and I are facing. He knows what is inside our box. He knows what's keeping us impossibly depressed or discouraged or held down. God looks at us. He sees us thinking about this impossible, confining place that we're in where everything feels so impossible. And he overhears what people are saying to us and how defeating it feels. <clears throat> and it's always been so amazing to me that Jesus knows what we're facing in our own lives and what situations that we're all going through. And he's telling us, don't be afraid, just have faith. The box that contains human responses and human possible outcomes is not the same box that our God lives in. And don't forget that Jesus wasn't giving us an option or making a suggestion when he said, don't be afraid, just have faith. That was a command. So reach outside the box. Thirdly, we must guard our faith by resisting the hopelessness of those confined to the box. At the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus encountered people crying and wailing loudly. That's an example of the hopelessness of those confined to the box, which is understandable because it looked like an impossible situation. Let's be honest, some people can't think outside the box. They can't think outside the box of possible human outcomes. And as a result, they say things like, oh, this is going to fail. That can't happen. This is impossible. You can't overcome this. You've just come to a dead end. You've got to stop, and so on and so on. But that's what they're saying. Notice that Jesus didn't let anyone follow him to Jairus' house except Peter, James, and John. He was guarding the atmosphere of faith. And sometimes there are people in our lives who are going to be naysayers. They're going to be negative people who say that it can't happen. It won't happen. You'll never get out of this. This is the end. It's time for you to stop, to give up. Don't listen to them. Guard the atmosphere of your faith. Resist the hopelessness of those in the box. Jesus only took Peter, James, and John because he knew that they believed that he was outside the box and he could operate outside the box. In Hebrews eleven six, 6, it says, It is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe that God exists and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him. Often those rewards come from outside the box, beyond our thoughts and our dreams. The fourth thing we must do is believe the words of faith that come from outside the box. Jesus said, The child's not dead but asleep. And everyone thought he was crazy. They'd seen the body. They'd seen the little girl. She was dead. She had no pulse. She had no heartbeat. There was no breath. She was dead. They questioned Jesus' words. But Jesus was speaking words of faith. And God is speaking to our situations today. God wants to speak to us from outside the box. He wants us to know that those situations that we think are dead, the thing that you think is dead is not dead. It is only asleep. We've got to ignore the hopelessness and the contempt of those who are confined to the box. Those who cannot think outside the box and those who cannot believe outside the box. You cannot allow that to affect your faith. God has words of faith for you. And he will deliver them to you through time spent with him in prayer or through his word or through worship or through friends or through nature and more. And the fifth thing we must do is face our impossible situation with Jesus at our side. When Jesus went in to see the young girl, he took the parents and the disciples who were men of faith. What were they doing? They were facing the impossible situation with Jesus at their side. I don't know what impossible situations that you're going through, but I do know that when you guard your faith and believe that those things which can't happen in the human possibility can happen in this place. And when you walk into those situations with Jesus at your side, you will be able to enjoy what only exists outside the box. Can you imagine the brief second when Jesus reached out and grabbed the little girl's hand and told her to get up? I'm sure that time seemed to slow way down with mom and dad watching closely. 
and most likely holding their breath. And then she moved. What an exciting moment. And it was possible because they entered into an impossible situation with Jesus at their side. What situation do you need to invite Jesus into? And lastly, we must remember that we are human. It would have been really easy for people to think, oh, this little girl has been raised for the dead, so she's not human anymore. She doesn't need to eat. But what does Jesus say? He told them to get her something to eat. You see, our God who works outside the box understands what life is like inside the box. And he wants you and I to enjoy life in the box with the blessings of what comes from outside the box. And perhaps you are facing an impossible situation today. Maybe it has to do with a relationship or a job. Maybe it's a dream. Maybe it's something else. I don't know. But I do know this. If you can think outside the box, if you can reach outside the box of what's humanly possible in faith, and if you can guard the atmosphere of faith, and that's really important, you need to be hanging out with people that believe, hanging out with people that think it's possible, people that see possibilities outside the box, and you can believe the words of faith that God speaks to you in his word, Ignore those that are confined with the box, within the box who think that nothing can happen except what's in the realm of possibility for humans. And you can take the hand of Jesus and walk confidently into your situation with Jesus at your side. Then you can enjoy what only exists outside the box. I don't know what you're facing today. I don't know your impossibility. But I do know a God for whom nothing is impossible. Jairus learned that God's timing and purpose are not like ours. Sometimes he requires patience from us. Sometimes he waits longer than we think is rational. Sometimes he allows temporary loss in order to show us eternal abundance of his blessing. There is nothing that God cannot do. Nothing is impossible with him. We should repeat that to ourselves every day until it becomes part of our belief system I think too many times we don't really know this we certainly don't live like we serve a God of the impossible and why do I say that because we know that God has promised to take care of our needs yet we worry about our needs on a regular basis we know that God has promised to never leave us or forsake us yet we doubt if God is with us when we can't feel him We know that God has sent the Holy Spirit as our comforter, yet we try to find comfort in things. And we know that God loves us, but we ignore him or neglect him or avoid him. And looking at our resources when we are faced with an impossible situation usually causes us to doubt how God will take care of us. So we need to change our perspective from looking at our resources to start looking at God's unlimited resources and power. Theologians have a term for God's power, omnipotent, meaning that there is nothing that God cannot do. And there's an old chorus that was written in 1945, which describes God's unlimited power. It says, got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you cannot tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible, and he cannot, can do what no other power can do. Nothing is impossible for the one who created and sustains the universe in which we live. He commanded storms to be still. He gave sight to the blind, healed a sick woman, and raised the dead back to life. And sometimes we doubt the power of God to work in our specific circumstances because we haven't personally experienced it. So what if we put down our doubts? What if we laid aside our fears? What if we let go of our need to control our own lives? What if we put our faith and trust in a God who can do anything, even the impossible? What might happen in your life? What might God have in store for you if you just let go and took hold of him? God wants us to trust him and let our faith in him take us where he wants us to go. But as long as we keep holding back, we will never be free to experience all that God has for us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to share. I pray that you will help us live lives of faith. Help us to walk confidently with you into our impossible situations. 
I ask that you would allow us to enjoy what can only be enjoyed through faith. And I pray a special blessing over each impossible situation represented today. And Lord, allow us to see a miracle. In your name we pray. Amen.
Well, friends, thanks so much for joining us today. If you think this video could help someone today, if you'll like and subscribe or share the video, we would really appreciate it. If you want to help support the ministry of Next Level Church, we would really appreciate it if you would go to our give page at nextlevelchurch.org slash give. This helps us raise the reputation of Jesus where we live, work, and pray, play, and we would really appreciate it. Um, by way of benediction today, I want to leave you with Hebrews 11.6, and it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. Smith Wigglesworth said, There's nothing impossible with God. All the impossibility is with us when we measure God by the limitations of our own unbelief. So today, please go forth and believe in God with everything you have. He has a miracle just for you. Have a wonderful day.